looking at um, what you can do user interface wise to generate reusable code. Uh, that's a theme in software in general, all right? Um, whether you're talking about web development or traditional programming or um, anything. I mean, back in the days when I did COBOL, believe it or not, all right, um, we had things that were called copy files. And what copy files were, were you would place the code in a file, and then you'd bring that file into a various number of programs. So if you had some, some functions, um, if you had some uh, code that you wanted duplicated across a bunch of different programs, you didn't have to duplicate the code. You could just bring the copy file in, and then you'd be, you'd be good to go. So, I mean, th this isn't a new concept, but it's one of those concepts that's like, it's always going to be there. Because the idea is to have everything in one place. If everything's in one place, then it can't be inconsistent, right? You can't say that one thing is inconsistent. You can only say two things are inconsistent with each other, or three things are inconsistent, or four things are inconsistent. So if the code is in one place, then it can't be inconsistent. It might be wrong, all right? You could have a bug in the code, or you might need to change it for other reasons, but the good news is you only need to change one thing. So that's our goal with programming. That's also, interestingly enough, our goal with database design, which we'll be getting into possibly today, but probably on uh, Thursday. Thank okay. you. I was just about to say Wednesday, then I realized this is a Tuesday, Thursday class. Um, so that's also a goal with that. And, and again, for the same reasons. Um, it's interesting how there's sort of a parallel between the data and the code. All right. At any rate, so we looked at, uh, you know, just to review some of the things we have. We have CSS that isolates the appearance of our web page and puts it in one place. We have um, the ASP.NET components. That allows us to sort of jumpstart our application by we don't have to code every little thing. We can use components and configure them to do the job for us. And we have consistency with that. All right? And we have something that is probably better tested than our code is going to be. Not to say that there wouldn't be a bug occasionally, but it's probably better chance that it's well tested than your code is well tested. Um, those are things like the ASP.NET validator controls, uh, or, or the example that comes to mind. That's a component to do validation. You know, you don't have to worry about writing that down. Um, we have custom classes, which we explored in the rock, paper, scissors game. Uh, and, and now we've learned a couple of things that, that sort of help us do that. And the first one of those was master pages. And let's just take a second to review that. And I think where we left off last time is we were talking about menus and other navigation. So let's talk about that. under file, new, file, 
and you pick master page. We are going to again check place code in separate file. We do have an option to select another master page, so we can have nested master pages. Um, the, the idea of that would be, again, a master page is where we're going to put common um, UI stuff, it's common, I, I want to say HTML code, but common HTML code and ASP.NET code. We could also have a code behind associated with it. All right. So, for example, we might have a logon or a search or something like that on every single page. All right. If we were to do that, then um, we would have a combination of um, the user interface stuff, that is the ASP.NET controls and HTML and uh, C sharp coding. So, at any rate, we create a master page this way. We click add. And what we get is we get a page that has two placeholders in it. All right? And those are the places where on every individual page that implements this master page, we, we put our code custom for them. So we get two blank spots that we can put that in. The rest of the code, the code outside of these placeholders, is code that's going to be on every page. All right? So let's look at the master page that we had actually created. I'm going to delete this one. Here's the master page we already created. And we can view it either in uh, source view or design view. Notice that for the most part, it is like a uh, regular ASPX page, which is an ASPX page is like an HTML page, other, uh, with the exception that in addition to HTML code, we can also have ASP.NET controls. Notice we have two content placeholders. In the master page, there will be nothing in those two content placeholders. That's where every place that clones this master page, we put the custom code. All right? So... This has the HTML tag, it has a head tag, it has a title, it has a style sheet link, which means every page is going to get the style sheet. It has uh, the body with the header. And we actually created two content placeholders, or actually three content placeholders, because you get two by default, we created a third one, that we could put a second piece of, of custom con, uh, content. We have our navigation on the master page, which makes sense, right? When you think about the master page, you think of the stuff that you want to be on every single page. So typically, there is some sort of main navigation that's going to be on every page. Now, you might have a sub-navigation that appears on some pages. We gave the example of uh, Lorraine Community College's site, where depending on the section of the site that you're in, the sub-navigation is different, all right? Um, that could be implemented using a different master page for each subsection then of the site. That would be one way to implement that. The content placeholders, again, we have nothing there. The footer, we have something that we want to be common. So, in a nutshell, this is the common HTML on our website, which typically is going to be a header section, a navigation section, and a footer. There could be other stuff too, but that's sort of a very typical thing, especially for a smallish sort of site. We then have one content placeholder where we can put our main content for the site, and we have a second one that I added just to demonstrate how to add a second one. So, let's look how this page gets implemented by going at the default page. Uh, our default page, we set the title up here. We still have nothing in the headers content section, uh, or the heads uh, content placeholder. Under the quip um, content placeholder, I have just a little quote, there's no place I call for the home page. And then under the main content area, I have a heading H1 and then some text about it. So let's run this page.
And we'll see pieces of this page come from the master page, pieces of the page come from the page itself. All right, this is in the master page. This is in the master page. This is in the master page. These two sections here are filled in in the actual um, ASPX page. And if we navigate around, I think I did a few of these. Pizza, video games, music, all right. I don't think I actually wrote those pages. I just did them to demonstrate the mouse over menu. You'll notice that we have a very consistent look and feel for those pages. The, P, uh, the video games page and the music page, that kind of looks goofy because I didn't go in and fill in that content uh, placeholder for those pages. If I remember right, I added that after the fact. Any questions about master pages? All right, the menu control is, I think, where we left off last time. On the master page, we have, oh, notice this, by the way. If I'm looking at one of the pages, let's say I'm looking at the default page, I can't edit this, all right? I can't edit that because that is part of the master page. It's probably good that it does it that way, right? Uh, it's a little bit of a pain then. You have to go to the master page to make the change. But it's probably good because if you see this, you're liable to think, oh, I can change that without realizing that that's going to affect other pages as well. So I can go and change this guy because that's part of the default page, but I can't change this guy because that's part of the master page. All right. Um, so I go to the master page, and here is the menu. And what we can do is set the properties for this menu, edit menu items. And I went in, and this is very similar to uh, when you define a dropdown. All right, you can define the items. The difference being is that you can put the items that you define at different levels. So, I put home, pizza, video games, and music all on the first level. Pizza places and pizza types I put as sort of a sub-menu selection under pizza. Video games, mobile, and console I put under video games, music, listening, and performing I put under music. You create it simply by, you can either create a new child element or a new root element. A new root element will put it on the first level. A new child element will put it underneath whatever option you have selected. Yes? Um, if you wanted to make images, like what you click on for each nav piece, would you just use the image URL and like, get rid of the text? Like, I know that's probably not like an ordinary situation, but if you were to do that. Uh, URL for the image for the menu item? Yeah, I guess so. I've, I've never done that. I've, I've just used text for that. But, I, yeah, I would imagine so. Pop was pop out image. The URL for the image that shows that the menu item has children. Okay, that's the little, we have this little diamond. That would be to change that. Image URL, I think, would be the image for this. Okay. Um, I will s sort of give a disclaimer about using... Um, images for navigation items, that, that makes the page less accessible for people that are visually impaired because they can't see what the image is, whereas their screen reader can read, can read the text to them. The, the screen reader, reader can't read the image to them. If you make a mistake about where you put something, like if I put pizza places underneath video games, you can move it around simply by dragging it, I think. Oh, you can move it around by, by with this arrow. And then you can move uh, and make something a, a, uh, a sibling off its parent, or you can demote it. So you can move it back and forth using those controls. So if you don't get it right the first time, you can rearrange those elements. All right? 
for each of these elements, you, you indicate a text, a value. The value could be used in scripting, similar to you would use for the dropdown. And most importantly, we have a navigate URL, and that is the place that you go to when you click this. All right. This is for each item. All right. The one thing that we didn't talk about last time is the menu itself has some properties. Disappear after. In other words, when you pull your mouse off of the item and pull it, you, when you put your mouse on the item, it will expand the menu. When you pull it off, it doesn't disappear instantly. It sort of hangs there. I don't know. I guess some people would think that's a cooler way to do it. I, I don't, it doesn't really matter to me, right? But some people would. Um, there's all kinds of styling things that you can use. We'll talk about style in a minute here because I do think it's important. Um, maximum dynamic display levels. This would be if you were binding this to a database that had your URLs, or uh, we'll look at probably later today something called a sitemap path or sitemap XML. So this says that this can go three levels deep. This is the orientation, which can either be vertical or horizontal. Unfortunately, if we do that, we'd have to change the CSS to see it. I'll go in real quick and say nav has a width of 100%. Not a thousand percent, but a hundred percent. And now we see that it's oriented horizontally. I'm going to go and change that back. But again, you can make the menu be oriented vertically or horizontally just by changing the properties of it. Or some of the other properties that are relevant. Static display levels. That's how many levels you want to display by default, right? If you mouse over this, it will show the levels underneath it. But I could say I want to display two levels by default. And that will show two levels of links. Or I could just say, hey, I want one. And it will show one. Visible or invisible, it's set visible. Uh, we could hide it if, if we wanted to. When might we want to hide a menu? I can think of one real good case where we might want to hide a menu. Maybe like a Maybe on a phone, that's true. We could do some sort of, um, we could do some sort of uh, uh, device detection, and based on that, we could um, hide a menu. That would be one possibility. Um, another way that we could address that would be by giving different style sheets to make the make the uh, make the menu look different. Because in some cases we might want to hide the menu, in other cases we might simply want to display it a little differently. So that's uh, another way to do it. What will be another case where you might want to hide a menu? Don't you love when instructors have a real specific answer in their head and they expect you to mind read? Here's the one I'm thinking of. What if it was an administrator's menu? What if you had a website that um, users could go in and do stuff, but um, also people, admin, site administrators could go? For example, think of our poll. I talk about having a poll uh, uh, for your project where you could put in polls like, you know, my favorite Harry Potter house is, and then they can pick which one, all right, and they can vote for it. Well, you wouldn't want everyone going in and entering questions, all right? 
uh, that probably wouldn't be a good idea for any number of reasons. All right? You probably want some control about who can enter questions. So therefore, you would, you would have some sort of administrator that would put in the polls and, and do other things, other things that only administrators would be able to do, you know, like, like block a user if they're abusive or whatever. All right? So you could put all those things on a menu, all right? And you could even do this on the master page, so you'd only have to do this once, all right? You could have code then on the master page that look to see if the person that logged in is an administrator. If they are an administrator, then don't display the menu. If they are an administrator, then display the menu. And that would, that would take care of it. And the nice thing is, is that would take care of it every place. You wouldn't have to go and uh, do it on every individual page. So again, that kind of thing is possible using master pages um, as well. All right. Any questions about these menus? There is another thing that is like, oh, I wanted to show something about styling. I'm going to go and delete, or I'm going to point out what was there before. Level 2. If you remember before, level 2, there was no style for it. And therefore, when we expanded the menu, it was transparent and it made it hard to read because you could see the text from the other section underneath it. What I did, if you want to style something, what you need to do is you need to know what HTML gets generated. So that's sort of a key principle of mine. That's one that I actually had a, a big argument with, with someone that actually wanted me to write a chapter in a textbook. All right? Uh, someone wanted me to write a chapter about ASP.NET for their textbook. And I was like, you know, does it pay anything? And they're like, yeah, it pays. And they told me how much. It's like, oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, I'll do it. All right? So I did it. I wrote a chapter. And in it, I, I spent a lot of time talking about the HTML that gets generated by the ASP.NET controls. Well, the person that I wrote the chapter for didn't like that. He's like, well, well people that read this book aren't going to know HTML and blah, 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 blah. And it's, and it's like, you need to know HTML at least to this level to use ASP.NET effectively. Because if you don't know HTML at all, you're not going to code ASP.NET effectively because, you know, ASP.NET creates HTML, so you need to know what you're creating. You know, you can't write a program to write a novel unless you know how to write a, no unless you know how to write a novel, right? You can't write a program to, write, to make music unless you know how to, how to write music. All right, so at any rate, um, we went back and forth. In the end, they didn't use my chapter, but they paid me anyhow, so I didn't really care. All right, <laughs> end of story. So, in this case, we wanted to style, in fact, I'll re recreate this. We wanted to style the second level things so that they didn't have a transparent background. So, like right here, notice they have a transparent background. So, what I did is I did a view source. I looked for the code that got generated. I saw all of those menus were in a class called level two. All of the second level links were in a class called level two. So that's my hook, right? To write CSS for something, you have to have a hook. You have to wait to identify the thing that you want to get that CSS. The hook in more precise technical terms, it's called a selector. You have to know the selector to use to um, create your CSS to apply to the things that you want it to apply to. In my case, and in the selector can be a combination of these things, the HTML tag that gets generated, the ID, or the class. Well, in this case, the class is the best one because I want to do this to all the things that have a class of level two. All right? So once I realize that that is my hook, I can go into my style sheet and I can put in that for everything with a class of level 2, set the background to white, set the padding to 5 pixels. And then when I run it, I don't have that problem of overlapping. That will be the answer to many of your styling questions, all right? 
if you're if you can't style something exactly right, um, look to see what the HTML generated is, and then see what selectors you can use to address that. A small warning is keep in mind that you can put style things in the ASP.NET controls themselves too. Notice, for example, bless you. With this guy, whoops. There's stuff we can do styling wise here. I usually avoid those unless I have no other choice. My first choice is to do the styling via CSS. Why? Why is my first choice to do styling via CSS? Yes. So it's all in one place, and it's going to be consistent across pages and so on. If I went in and styled this a certain way here, and I wanted another page to have that style, have similar things styled, if I wanted submenus, for example, to be styled the same way, I'd have to go and duplicate the submenus, this. Again, any time you have to do something more than once, it's, it's, it's not as good as if you only have to do it once to make the change. All right. There is a cousin to the menu control. And I'm going to put it on this page, but keep in mind that you would never have both of these together on the same page, right? Because you pick which one you like better, and you would use it. And this is a tree view. What's the difference between a tree view and a menu view? The difference is, is that a tree view, you can click to have certain submenus stay open. Whereas with a menu view, the submenus only appear when you mouse over them. Alright? So when I show the difference, it'll be it'll be it'll be obvious. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and I'm gonna add a tree view to this guy. And I'm gonna do this in the code view so I get it in the right place. I want the tree view to be right here. I'm going to drag that there. All right. This is going to look really similar to the menu view. I'm going to go in and, whoops. I'm going to edit the nodes. I'm going to add a node. This will be my home page. that. I don't want to close it. I'm going to add another one. I'm going to add a child note underneath this. So I'm going to type in pizza places. And I don't think I actually have a URL for this, so I'll just make one up. Oops, I put that in the wrong place. Yeah, I can shove it over. All right, pizza types. duplicate the whole menu. I'm just going to uh, duplicate enough of it so that we can see how this works.
do. I'm not going to duplicate the whole thing. You see, it's pretty much identical to how we created that for the most part. Here's the difference, though. First of all, notice that it's showing two things by default. That's also a property of the tree view, just like it was with the with the uh, what you call it menu. Expand depth is how big it's going to be by default. I lied. It is, it is when you use data binding, how, how big it's going to be. And we're not using, well, we're not using data binding right now. How much we indent each node, we could also probably do that via CSS. a node, it stays closed. When we open it, it stays open. <clears throat> That's different than this, which appears and disappears based on our mouse over. So it's simply a different way that we can navigate. Notice as I go from page to page, if I close both of these and I go to the pizza page, it actually redid that. But you could close and open the tree view. So that is, again, a difference between the tree view and this. This one, it always shows and hides based on the mouse over. This one, you can say what, whether you want it open or closed. And if you open it, it stays open until you close it. Does it keep reloading the master page? Well, it doesn't, re yeah, it, keep, it reloads the page which contains stuff from the master page. Right. I am overlooking that property. Isn't that the one I was changing? Yeah. There I go. It's always one less. So zero will show only the root. One will show the root and the first level underneath it. So that's what I want. So now notice it shows those. I expand it. I go to another page, and it's back to the way it was. And I can expand it again if I want to, or contract it. So again, you would never have both of these on the same page. All right? Um, you would decide which one you wanted. Yes? Did you have the breadcrumbs? Yeah, that's what, just what I'm about to do. Someone read the assignment. 
or asked a very good question just off the top of their head. Either one. So you get credit either way, all right, by the way, you know. Uh, so, breadcrumbs. To implement breadcrumbs, you need a site map, all right? What's a site map? Well, in the old days, a lot of sites had site maps, and some of them still do. I don't know if you really need a separate site map page, but a site map sort of gives a description of how your site is structured. And that is useful to, um, to uh, that is useful in showing breadcrumbs. Does everyone know what we mean by breadcrumbs? Does everyone know the story that the word breadcrumbs comes from? Hansel and Gretel. Hansel and Gretel, right? Hansel and Gretel. yeah. All right. Someone, someone tell the story of Hansel and Gretel. What, what was the idea? How do breadcrumbs, how are breadcrumbs relevant? It marks their path. Marks their path, right? So, in other words, they were walking through the woods and they were trying to find the evil witch or get, get away from the evil witch or something like that. So they, they just, they took their sandwich and they broke off into part and left breadcrumbs no, uh, on the route. Their dad was abandoned in the, in the woods because they couldn't feed them anymore. But they what? were going to try to come. You don't remember this part? <laughs> I, must have, I must have suppressed it. I, 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 I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to talk to my analyst about this, uh, this one. Okay, yeah. so Hansel and Gretel's parents couldn't afford to keep them anymore, so they dropped them out in the woods. But... They were smart the first time and grabbed a bunch of stones and left little stones on the way home and they on, on the way out and they found their way home and their parents were like, well crap, let's do this again. So this time they dropped them out in the woods. The kids didn't have stones with them so the only thing they had with them was breadcrumbs. So they left the breadcrumbs out in the woods and the birds ate the breadcrumbs. And then they, they couldn't find their way home and they ended up at the witch's house. Now, a couple, a couple things about that story. First of all, if there wasn't enough food to eat, why would you lay breadcrumbs? I know, right? right? <laughs> Especially given the fact that, that by the first thought I had is, wouldn't the birds eat those? And secondly, after your parents abandoned you uh, the first time in the woods and you miraculously found your way back, <laughs> Wouldn't you say, maybe I'm better off without these people? You know, uh, and, and yeah, so at any rate. Um, these breadcrumbs, though, birds can't eat, all right? So the breadcrumbs on a web page show you the path that, that you went. Um, let me see if I can find an example before we, before we uh, actually do this. Maybe we should do this every, every week. We should talk about famous stories and how horrible they actually were. I'm sure there are. There's probably degree programs in it. Yeah. All right, here's an example. Or, I know one. That was the cleanup version. That was the cleanup version. Yeah, I do know some of those fairy tales were really way worse, like in the original version, and they sort of sanitized them. So that was a cleaned out version, you said, huh? Let's look for ASP.net books on Amazon. And let's pick a product. Here's one. This shows you how you got to this page. Let's say you were on a web page uh, that showed uh, photographs from your summer 2015 vacation in Italy. It would say you got there by going to, first of all, the summer 215 link, your pictures link, and from the home page. So what this is saying is this is essentially 
repeating the structure that from the home page, you have a pictures page. From the pictures page, you have a summer two, uh, 2015 page. From summer uh, 2015, you have a page for Italy. All right? So that's what we have to do. Well, it would be difficult to code that on each page, especially if things changed and so on and so forth. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a file that explains the structure of our website. And that file is called a site map path. All right. Now, the sitemap path file uses XML. All right. Does any does anyone know what XML is? XML is extensible markup language. So it actually starts with an E, but the marketing people, I guess, thought the X was cooler. So XML. You know, the X games and, and all that, you know. So, XML is extensible markup language. What that is, is it's the use of markup language to solve any problem that you want to solve with it. All right, any sort of data storage or structuring you can do in XML. As long as the person making the data and the person using the data knows how you've defined it, then everything will be okay. Well, Microsoft defined a certain XML layout for a sitemap path. And as long as you follow that, all right, you'll be in good shape. But, all right, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to create our sitemap path for our website in which we explain the structure of our website. And then we're going to tell our menus and our breadcrumbs to use that sitemap. So, Away we go. File. New. File. Sitemap. It's called web.sitemap. I click add. It gives us the start of a sitemap. All right. When I defined XML, I said it's a markup language. What does a markup language mean? It's a language that uses tags. So there's tags in here, just like there's tags in any markup language. For example, HTML, there's tags, right? And there's rules in HTML about what tags you have. You know, you can't just go make it up your own tag. You just can't make up your own tag for this, right? Now, you can define your own XML format for something else, but for this, it's already been defined. There's only one tag you need to worry about, and that's the sitemap node, all right? And the sitemap node is what? It's a page on your website. So that's not the hard part. That's the easy part. The hard part is getting them nested correctly. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this. I'm going to create a sitemap path with no nesting at all. That's my first step I'm going to do, just to have nothing nested. And we're going to see how that works. All right. So my home page is default.aspx. And it is a home page. What are some of my other pages? Pizza.aspx. Pizza. We then add pizza places.aspx. Title pizza places. Yes. Does that title have to match the title? Like if you wrote something else in, in the title, like so it tags different. Does um, it it, it doesn't have to, but it would be a pretty good idea if it was somewhat consistent, so it's not confusing. Uh, for example, here I'm saying the title is Pizza Places. If the title of the Pizza Places page was Pizza Restaurants. That could potentially be a little confusing. 
So I want to try to keep them consistent. On the other hand, if it was something like my title, because I have a lot of space, I made at pizza restaurants in Ohio, and I decided to make just the title here, pizza restaurants, that would be okay, because it would be clear that, that the one was just an abbreviated version of the other. So I'm going to go, and again, I'm going to make this with no nesting at all, other than the nesting that all of these sitemap tags are underneath the home page. That's what that represents. Here's the starting tag for the home page. Here's the ending tag for the home page. All these pages are considered underneath the home page. One rule about XML is there has to be one tag that contains everything, right? Any markup language has that. In an HTML document, for example, that's the HTML tag. Your HTML tag goes around everything that you've created. Um, in this case, with this markup language, the tag that contains everything is the sitemap node tag. So let's go. And I have... I'm going to go and put a few more pages in here. So I just have to change this. I believe I had next video games. This one I do want to do um, completely, even if it takes a long time for me typing. So these are all the pages on my site, and they're described in this XML file. The nice thing is, is this XML file can be used to do a couple things. One of the things it can be used for is to populate either our menu or our tree view. Okay, we can save it. If there's errors in the stuff, like if we violate the rules of XML, we get a squiggly just like we do in ASP.NET that says you can't have that there. All right. So let's go back to our master page. And I'm going to get rid of these. I'm going to get rid of this one, especially. I, I, I hope, you know, you can try it on your own if you want to do that one. And this one, I'm going to go and I'm going to pick, actually, I'm going to delete this one, too. And I'm going to start from scratch and add a new menu. So instead of going in and saying edit data items, I'm going to say choose data source. I wish we had, I wish, like, this class had a soundtrack like with an orchestra performing behind it, because right now there'd be like dramatic music. <laughs> yeah, because right. this is an important concept that might not seem important right now, but it's going to become real, real, real important going forward. 
and that is the notion of data binding. All right? Data binding is the idea of this. When we have something on a page, let's say a list of books from Amazon that we did a search on, or a list of comments on a Facebook post, or a bid on a, uh, a, an item on eBay, anything like that. There's really two pieces to that. There's the data and where the data came from, and then there's the way that the data is being displayed. So we have the raw data and the source of the data is one thing. The way that we choose to display it is another thing. We want these to work sort of independently, but they have to be linked together somehow. They have to be, for example, if we do a search on Amazon, we might get back a table. The visual presentation is a table, but the data source is the database from Amazon. We want those two things to be treated independently so we can change one without changing the other. All right? Maybe, for example, for recommendations from Amazon. Uh, Amazon uh, always recommends stuff that you can buy. Like it looks at your history and says, hey, based on what you bought in the past, maybe you want these items. They may, they probably are continually refining that algorithm, right, to give better and better recommendations. In fact, I, th I heard Netflix, I think a few years back, had the million dollar challenge where if you could write a better recommendation algorithm than they had, they'd give you a million dollars or something like that. Um, so they're continually refining those things to like recommend what to, for what, what to watch or what to buy or whatever. But the way this is being displayed probably is going to stay the same. In other words, you're not going to notice that they changed the way that they recommended. Hopefully, you'll just notice that the recommendations are more and more relevant. All right? But the way it's displayed, it's going to stay the same. The reason for that, again, is the notion of data binding. You have the way it's displayed. You have the actual source of the data. So in this case, the source of the data is going to be our site map. Um, it's going to be our site map um, XML file that we just created. So that's the source of the data. The way we're going to display that is in a menu control. So we bind those together. I say that the source of the data for this menu is a new data source and it is a site map data source. It comes from a site map. And I click OK. Now when I run this, okay. notice what we have. We have home, and we put our mouse under it, on it, we have all these things. Right. So I didn't have to go in and enter those in. I entered them in when I entered in the site map, okay? And that's, as Martha Stewart would say, it's a good thing, all right? So I put it in once, I can display it a couple other places. Now, where do breadcrumbs get displayed here? Well, I'm not, yeah, let's, let's talk about breadcrumbs. Then we'll go back and we'll fix the site map. Because this, uh, this actually isn't correct, right? I should have a section for pizza, a section for video games, and a section for music. Yeah, Underneath right. pizza, I would have these two. Underneath video games, I would have these two. Underneath music, I'd have these two. So we're not exactly correct yet, but we can still add our breadcrumbs. And the nice thing is, is when we make change to the site file, sitemap file, it's going to change not just our breadcrumbs, but it's going to change the menu too. Because both those things are going to be bound to the sitemap. All right? Win-win situation. So we go here, and would I put this on each individual page, or would I put it on the master page? Master. Yeah, probably the master page, because I probably want this everywhere. So I'm going to go to the master page, and I'm going to pick sitemap path. Sitemap path is the same thing as breadcrumbs. It's just breadcrumbs is a more sort of informal way to say it. 
So we're going to put this. I don't like where I put it, so I'm going to undo that. Let me go in the actual code. I want to put it in the header. right underneath that little paragraph. So I'll put it there. And there it shows me the site map path. All right, shows it pretty generic, but that's okay. Now, when we run this, I have a sneaking suspicion we're going to get an error. All right. Let's see if I'm right. I lied. We didn't get an error. That's good. That's good. No errors. All right. So our sitemap path says home, right? Because that's where we are. We're on the home page. If I go and click on pizza, it says that we went from the home to pizza. If we went from home to pizza places, oh, I don't have that page. That's right. I'll have, to go, in, I'll have to go in and add that in. All right. Let me go and add that pizza places page in. This will be a good example of how to create a page from a master page. form, select master page, and I'll give it the right name. Pizza Places. I'll click add. I want to use this master page. And This will contain a, a list of favorite pizza places. Okay, so now let's run this. So if I go to home, I'm at the home page. That's not a link, notice. If I go to pizza places, I get that. Notice the last one is not a link, but the previous ones are. So I could another way to go home would be to click that. All right, but the structure isn't correct because pizza places and pizza types should be underneath pizza. Video, uh, old school video games and console should be under video games. Music listening and performing should be underneath there. So how do I fix that? I fix that by changing what. Do I change the sitemap file or do I change the menu and the breadcrumbs? Do I want to change the way the data is or do I want to change? Well, that's a deceptive question. I want to change the structure of the data. I want to say that pizza contains these two things. Well, right now, everything is listed as being underneath the home. So I will go in to my sitemap path. And I will put nesting in. If you notice, all these tags right now, make it a little bit smaller, hopefully you can still see it. These are all empty tags, which means that this is a start tag and end tag rolled into one. So nothing is nested other than all of these are underneath the home page. So how do I make it nested? I can get rid of the end part of this tag, and I can put the sitemap node end tag here. When I do this, it's important to physically indent it as well.
because if you don't indent it, it's going to be very hard to tell what's contained in what. So all I'm doing is I'm putting these two sitemap node tags inside of this sitemap node tag. I do that by getting rid of the end part of this empty tag and putting in a sitemap node end tag. And making sure it's properly indented. Oops, I put this in the wrong place. So now notice what I have. Notice what's different between this. What's different between this is now I have nesting of the sitemap node tags. So the Pizza Places page is underneath the home page. And underneath the home page is underneath the pizza section. tell if I was going to sneeze or not there. I had to pause. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. So now I run this. And we'll notice just by changing the data source, and again, I'm going to cue the orchestra for dramatic music, just by changing the data source, I'm going to change the way it was displayed. Because the way it's displayed is connected, is bound to the data source. So the menu is now going to have levels. And my sitemap path is now going to have levels. So I go and run this. And notice, under home, I have pizza. All right? Under pizza, I have pizza places and pizza types. <coughs> so I click, click on pizza places. Now notice my sitemap path says home, pizza, pizza places. So the proper nesting of those occurred. How did it occur? Because I bound my menu and I bound my uh, sitemap path, or breadcrumbs, both to the sitemap XML file. So if I make changes in the XML file, I make changes to that. So if I add a, if I add a page, if I were to add a page to my website, all I should need to do is add it to the sitemap page, and my navigation should be taken care of, and the breadcrumb should be taken care of. Now I did notice that we still have that problem with the text. I'll leave that for you to see if you can figure out and solve. Maybe we'll look at that first thing uh, on Thursday, if you want, if you have questions about it. But take a look, see if you can figure that one out. I'm not sure why it broke, but it did. I don't know. Weird. Are there any questions about this? All right, I will go unlock the door to the lab, then I'll come back and get the files, and um, we'll see you in the lab. Thursday will be, other than some questions about this, maybe a second review, we'll start on database stuff.